Okay, so hi everyone, good evening. Um, I know some people are still coming in, but since it's 6.01, I'm going to go ahead and kick this event off for tonight. So good evening, I'm Lena Rubin, Programming Associate at Village Preservation, and I'm so glad that you're all here with us this evening. Um, a quick bit about Village Preservation. We have been documenting, celebrating, and fighting for the preservation of Greenwich Village, the East Village, and NoHo since 1980. We work to expand and extend landmark and zoning protections and stop inappropriate development while also encouraging appropriate development in our neighborhoods. We host roughly 75 programs a year, all of which are now virtual and most of which are free and open to the public. Our events are meant to illuminate the cultural and architectural heritage, history, and depth and the value of preservation in our communities. We're a nonprofit membership-based organization, so your involvement and support mean the world to us. You can learn more on our website, villagepreservation.org, and please do consider becoming a member or making a donation if you're able at villagepreservation.org slash donate. We call our home the village, but it is also the unceded traditional land of the Lenape and Lensi peoples. I want to acknowledge in this archival recording the Lenape and Muncie communities and especially their elders, past and present, and express gratitude for their stewardship of this land, for contributing to its geography, and for the use of their language as place names. If you'd like to find out more about any of this, please reach out. I'm glad to offer resources. So just a bit of uh, Zoom protocol. Please feel free to use the chat to say hi, to tell us where you're joining from, um, or to raise any issues or thoughts. Um, but if you do have any questions for the, for the speaker, um, please use the Q&A function on your screen um, so that I can keep track of your questions. Um, you can submit those at any point during the talk. And when the talk is over, we will be taking some of these questions. Um, so I'm very pleased to turn the evening over to tonight's speaker, Lisandro Perez. Professor of Latin American and Latinx Studies at John Jay College, City University of New York. So whenever you're, you're ready. Thank you, Lena. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, thank you all for uh, attending uh, this session. It's always great uh, to know that there are people interested in the work that one does. And I jump at any opportunity to be able to share my research uh, especially among a, a crowd that I think, uh, such as this one, that I think will probably be fairly knowledgeable uh, on some of the things I'll be talking about, especially with respect to uh, the village. Uh, so let me uh, share with you here uh, my uh, uh, presentation, which I'll be uh, discussing, uh, but again, showing you uh, by slides. Uh, these are slides primarily with a lot of illustrations. I hope that's visible. Is that all right, Lena? Do you know? Yeah. Okay. So uh, it looks good to me. Pardon me. I just said it looks good to me. Yeah, okay. Great. Great. I just want to make sure that that was that was loaded on. Great. So this is my title. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, discuss generally at first my research on Cubans in New York, and then. For the purposes of this particular audience, uh, I've selected uh, several sites in the village that are important to uh, the history of Cubans in New York. And I think those are fairly significant sites. And uh, at least the most important one is still uh, there in terms of the uh, building or the structure itself. So uh, this research, uh, in case any of you are, uh, are interested, is found in my book, uh, which was published in 2018 by New York University Press. And it's entitled Sugar, Cigars, and Revolution, The Making of Cuban New York. And my focus was on the 19th century because I wanted to really explore the origins of the Cuban community and its development during that century as the community became an important player in the uh, history of Cuba during that century, especially in the struggles for independence. I'm very proud of the fact that, that in Cuba it, uh, it won an award and it was translated. And the uh, Spanish edition, which was published by Casa de las Americas in Havana, is, uh, you see it here. Uh, both of these, uh, both NYU Press and Casa de las Americas, I think, did a great job 
uh, uh, with the cover and generally with it. So let me launch into the first part of what I want to say, which is give you a context to the Cuban community, to the development of the Cuban community in New York, and then talk about these locations in the village, which may perhaps be of even greater interest to you. Uh, so I start the story of Cuban New York uh, far earlier than you might seem to think. Uh, on December 15th, 1823, uh, with the arrival of the ship Draper C. Thorndike from Gibraltar, carrying Father Felix Varela y Morales. Uh, Father Morales uh, was, uh, by even though a man, fairly young man in his 30s, uh, he was already a very respected intellectual figure in Cuba. Uh, he had gone to Spain to try to argue for greater autonomy and a self rule for Cuba. Uh, only to be chased by uh, the Spanish king. And the first boat that he uh, boarded uh, out of Gibraltar happened to go to New York. He arrived on that day of December 15th, 1823, in the east, uh, in the piers of uh, this side on South Street. Uh, and when he arrived there, there was already a very, very bustling commerce uh, with Cuba. Uh, the along South Street here, especially especially in this block just south of Maiden Lane, um, there were these establishments called counting houses, and the counting houses uh, were uh, commercial enterprises that basically received sugar from Cuba, also tobacco and molasses and other goods, um, and essentially and, uh, acted as commission agents uh, for the Cuban uh, planters. Uh, and uh, they opened accounts for them. Uh, they, in turn, purchased things they needed, consumer goods that they needed in New York, even things for their sugar mills, luxury items uh, for their homes in Havana, and shipped them back and kept accounts for them uh, there. So that very early, because of this sugar trade, there is this bridge established between New York uh, and, uh, and Havana and Matanzas, which was the other area of Cuba that was also exporting sugar. And here we see the basis of that sugar, of that sugar trade. Um, in 1792, the total production of sugar of Cuba was 13,800 tons. And yet only 62 years later, as you see here, it was up to half a million tons. Cuba went through, and all of you who are historians of uh, Cuba know this, went through a sugar revolution that really uh, transformed the island, transformed it demographically, socially, racially. Uh, by which uh, Cuba became a leading producer uh, of, uh, of uh, sugar cane, uh, which was uh, sold, of uh, sugar I should say, which was sold <clears throat> in a brown cake sort of form uh, in, uh, in New York, primarily. Uh, this was not exported to Spain. Uh, almost its entire production would go to the United States and especially to New York, where, of course, as, as, as you also you know, uh, New York was the most important sugar refining uh, center in the United States. And so these commission agents in the counting houses would receive this sugar from, uh, from the uh, sugar producers in Cuba, uh, resell it for them, of course, sell it to their refineries, and then essentially charge a commission, uh, there were commission agents, and kept accounts for them and purchase things for them. So the social class that arises in Cuba as a result of the sugar revolution, uh, what one historian called the sugarocracy, was really selling uh, their sugar in New York. And here you see one result of that. This is a chart I made from the Passenger Manifest. These are the number of passengers arriving in New York from Cuban ports and from Latin American and Spanish ports. That is differentiated. And you see here, in these decades from 1820s to 1830s, 1831 to 1840, 1841 to 1850, that uh, Cuban ports, passengers arriving from Cuban ports, far outnumber uh, the number of passengers arriving from all other Latin American and Spanish ports put together. The sugar trade resulted in this bridge uh, by which uh, Cuba uh, and New York became linked inexorably. I mean, actually, the Cuba trade accounted for not an insignificant amount of the entire total U.S. sugar trade picture. Uh, and this is the very basis for 
for the Cuban community in New York. We would become the largest uh, Latin American community in New York by far, as we shall see. And it was also, of course, important as a, uh, as a setting for a lot of the uh, um, separatist activities that Cubans engaged in during that decade. For example, the annexationist movement, which sought to, uh, in the 1840s, uh, annex uh, Cuba to the United States, uh, it was centered in New York. In fact, uh, the Cuban flag, which is the Cuban flag today, uh, was designed, flown for the first time in New York, specifically at the, um, in front of the uh, headquarters of the, of the offices of the um, New York Sun on Nassau and Fulton Streets in downtown, uh, in downtown Manhattan. Uh, this is, uh, as far as I can tell, I found this clipping uh, from the New York Sun in the New, York, in the New York Historical Society. And as far as I know, it is the first graphic depiction of the Cuban flag. And it happened in New York. And it happened in a New York newspaper. And the flag was thrown for the first time outside of a New York newspaper. So already we see this growth of a community in which it becomes a kind of a center uh, for Cuban activity outside of Cuba. And one of the things I argue in my book is that it becomes quickly a place of reference for Cubans. That is, New York becomes that other place in the Cuban uh, their uh, insularity became a place where the sugar was sold, but also where people went to plot a revolution, uh, to escape uh, perhaps uh, uh, royal persecution, excuse me, and, uh, and to maybe start a new life. Uh, there was a lot of back and forth traffic. So much so that by 1864, Simon Camacho, <coughs> who was a Venezuelan, who wrote uh, Cosas de los Estados Unidos in 1864, a very interesting book, says the following, Cuba, in Cuba, as far as I know, is where you can find the largest number of Cubans. But besides Cuba, nowhere else are there more Cubans than in the docks of the Columbia with an Marion on sailing day. Someone said it appears that New York is a neighborhood of Havana, and I could not disagree. So already there's an important presence of Cubans uh, in, in New York, but this is going to multiply as we uh, come upon October 10th, 1868, which is the outbreak of the first great war for Cuban independence. And I have here the map of Eastern Cuba, which is where that uh, um, uh, war started among essentially the Eastern planters who had less stake uh, in the continuation of Spanish rule and, uh, and decided that they no longer wanted uh, Spanish oppression, they wanted to be independent. And in so doing, they launched uh, this uh, war, which eventually involved, or, or the uh, sugarocrats of Havana and Matanzas, uh, eventually found themselves um, uh, uh, swept up with in it. Um, after October 10th, the, um, uh, it was a time to make a decision for many of the Cubans. And if you were not with the Spanish, you found yourself persecuted by the voluntarios and many of the Cuban uh, sugarocrats who were selling their sugar in New York uh, found themselves um, you know, uh, persecuted and had to leave the country. Of course, where are they going to leave? They leave to where they have their accounts. They leave to where they, save, where, where they uh, sell their sugar. And so if we look at the US census, for 1870, if we look at the 1870 U.S. Census, and I've tried to make this, this graph uh, based on the census data, uh, you have here the place of birth of what we could call, although it wasn't called then, the Hispanic population of New York, according to the U.S. decennial census. And you see here how the Cuban population from 1860 to 1870, in comparison to these other populations, literally skyrocketed. Uh, and it reaches in the 1870 census, which is the high point of the 19th century, it reaches 3,000 counted persons born in Cuba. So that doesn't include those who are not counted, and it doesn't include their children born in New York. So it was a significant population uh, by this time. Uh, and a great deal of the 
uh, activity regarding surrounding that war actually took place in New York. A lot of my book, two of the central chapters, are devoted precisely to the activities of Cuban emigres in New York during the period that this war lasted from 1868 to 1878. It was a war, of course, that was unsuccessful in attaining Cuban independence, uh, and New York became the center of activity uh, surrounding, uh, in terms of emigre activism uh, against Spanish colonialism. For example, let me give you a, let me show you a few documents. And by the way, there are a lot of documents on this period of time uh, because there is a very rich resource for all this Cuba trade in the New York Public Library. Uh, it is the Moses Taylor Papers. Moses Taylor was one of the most important, perhaps the most important counting house involved in the Cuba trade, and all of the records are in the uh, documents division of the New York Public Library. But let me show you one of those documents. This is an invoice from uh, the house of Mr. Charles Pond, who sells apparently a lot of Civil War uh, surplus uh, at 179 Broadway. And his customer is a Mr. Manuel Quesada, who's actually General Manuel Quesada, who is the brother-in-law of Carlos Manuel de Cespedes, uh, who was the president of the Cuban government in Orange in Cuba. And uh, General Casala is sent to New York to buy um, armaments uh, for the Cubans. And he walks into 179 Broadway and on, uh, as you see, December 20th of 1871. And he buys 2,000 Enfield rifles, uh, 2,000 sets of equipment, cartridges, bayonets, uh, wristbands, Remington carbines, etc. And it continues, uh, including uh, machetes, uh, saddles, etc and two Gatling cannons. Uh, and, you know, this is available for sale in New York. I'll show you what a Gatling cannon looks like. That's what a Gatling cannon looks like. And, and General Casala just walked into Mr. Pond's uh, establishment there in Broadway, across from City Hall, and, uh, and made off with all these armaments for, um, I think, the, the total cost what was that around. $3,000, $5,000, something like that. But money raised generally by Cuban exiles. Uh, here's another uh, document I wanted to share with you. Uh, many of the uh, Cuban exiles in New York who were uh, activists, activists in Cuban independence uh, actually were being, had, they had surveillance on them by the Pinkerton. Uh, the Spanish government had hired uh, the Pinkerton Detective Agency to keep track of Cuban's uh, uh, activities in New York. And notice that they, in this particular note, that is in the, Mesa, uh, in the uh, Moses Taylor papers, you'll see that, that any reference to any names have codes, right? We're going to meet in the house of so-and-so, the numbers. So this was all, uh, in many ways, also very intrigued, intrigue-filled sort of international uh, conflict and exiles uh, being pursued by, uh, by the Pinkertons and so forth. So having set that stage for why uh, there is this presence of Cubans in New York, and, and, and you know, largely the story of Latino New York in the 19th century is, demographically speaking, a, a Cuban story. Uh, so let me go on to talk about some important locations in the village that are related to this history. Uh, and again, the history goes on after that war, and we shall see that one of the things that, uh, that's important is the arrival uh, later in 18, the 1880s of Jose Martí, that important figure of Cuban independence. So I'm going to present three locations uh, and, and discuss three locations in the village that are important to this history. And I'm going to do so chronologically. So I started with the one that I think is the earliest in terms of its importance. And that is the Mora family enclave. The Mora family uh, was one of those exporters of sugar. Um, they very early established their presence as a family in, in New York. There are a lot of Moras that I found in the census who were related to each other. Uh, one problem that I have is that the Moras there is no good genealogy as opposed to the other families. Uh, there's not a good genealogy of the Mora. So frequently I don't know who's related to whom. 
Uh, but the core of the Mora family were these three individuals, as enumerated in the 1870 census. Jose Maria Mora was 58 years old. He lived at 217 East 12th Street, between 2nd and 3rd Avenues. Antonio Maximo Mora, who was his brother, uh, who lived at 220 East 12th Street, between 2nd and 3rd Avenues. And Jose Antonio Mora, who I believe, although I'm not totally certain, was the son of Jose Maria Mora, and he lived on 13th Street, uh, 235 East 13, again between 2nd and 3rd Avenue. The Moras, unlike many other Cubans uh, who, who, who exported uh, sugar to New York, uh, invested uh, a lot of their money in New York real estate. And they started buying up a lot of property precisely in this area. Right? They have 12th and 13th Street between 2nd and 3rd Avenues. Uh, here are those two addresses, and uh, this is the house of Antonio Maximo at 220. This is the house across the street uh, of, um, of uh, his, uh, his brother, Jose Maria Mora. Uh, you will all, I don't know if these are the actual houses. I don't know if these are houses that go back to the 1860s. Uh, some of you will be able to tell me that, but these are the addresses uh, at the very least. A lot of the information that I acquired from these families in New York uh, actually comes from the census. And let me show you this very interesting, uh, uh, for example, census uh, sheet. As you know, the enumerator would go in to the household <clears throat> and, uh, and uh, with a large sheet, he would start <clears throat> with the next household, which in this house case was household number 119. Uh, and it was the, uh, uh, house of Jose Antonio Mora, who we saw earlier, who lived at 235 uh, East 13th Street. Um, and Jose Mora, he appears here as Joseph, of course, 38 years old, sugar commission merchant, born in Cuba. His wife is Josephine, which is actually Josefa. Her age is uh, 37, uh, uh, and uh, she keeps home. They have all these children that you see here born in New York. They have three domestic servants, uh, Irish. And then you have, for example, down here, uh, an individual called Frank Mora, who's probably Francisco. His age is 30. He is a male and he's black. And he's a domestic servant and he's born in Cuba. Uh, and uh, I think we can safely conclude that that was probably a house slave who the Mora brought from Cuba, as did many of these families when they saw themselves forced to emigrate as a result of the war. Uh, they had money in New York, and in many cases, they took with them uh, the house slave. And I see a lot of examples of that in many, many of these families. Uh, one interesting thing about the Moras is that uh, the, the individual, Jose Maria Mora, that I uh, presented earlier as being one of, the, uh, one of the individuals, the father of this person, uh, Jose Mora, also had another son who became a photographer. Uh, and uh, Jose Maria Mora, his father, actually lost a great deal of his fortune because he donated quite a bit, donated quite a bit of it to expeditions that uh, were sent to Cuba with armaments to support the war effort. And Jose Maria Mora practically went broke. His son, therefore, um, chose a profession as a photographer. And here he is advertised in the December 1876 issue of El Ateneo. He's a photographer at 707 Broadway. And uh, many of you who deal with antiques and uh, photographs and so forth may be familiar with the name of Mora. Um, and here he is. This is an auto, I guess, uh, an auto portrait of himself. And uh, also that of his uncle, whose name we saw earlier, Antonio Maximo Mora. And he was known, uh, that is the photographer, was known as being the photographer of the rich and famous. Literally, that was the term that was used in one of the press clippings about him. And here's his portrait, for example, of Chester Arthur. You see it's signed by him. And also a portrait of uh, William Cullen Bryant. Okay. So the Moras here <clears throat> were a, a pretty important uh, family in this neighborhood. Um, and let me show you some others. Uh, photograph. This is Lillian Russell, right? uh, because he also photographed a lot of uh, theater uh, people, a lot of theater stars, uh, a lot of uh, celebrities 
uh, Buffalo Bill Cody, and this is over here, Alice Vanderbilt, as the spirit of electricity. Right? And uh, an actress by the name of Maud Branscombe as Ophelia, of course. So he was a quite a well-known photographer, and he was, again, uh, he was actually born in Cuba, uh, but he came over with his family and uh, established themselves in this part of the East Village. I have um, uh, long believed that one of the areas of more investigation that is necessary uh, after I wrote my book or that I would like to do is the degree to which the Moras established a very strong Cuban enclave there in the East Village, uh, essentially on 13th, 14th, 12th streets uh, between 2nd, 3rd, 1st Avenue in that area. Because occasionally I come up with Cubans who lived there, and in the 1870 census, this area was they had the heaviest concentration of Cubans in the entire city. And I think it partly is the result of the early investment that the Moras made in real estate in this area. For example, Domingo de Goicuria, who is a figure in Cuban history, uh, he was one of those who fought in the uh, Ten Year War, and he was actually executed. Uh, by the Spanish. He was captured by the Spanish and he was executed in 1870. Uh, here's a representation of his, of, his, of his execution. He was actually a uh, one of these Cuban New Yorkers. He became, in fact, a U.S. citizen, as you can see here, on June 12, 1865. And you see where he lived at 127 East 12th Street, which is one block over. The interesting fact associated with this is that Domingo de Goicuria was married to Amora, Carlota Mora. Uh, and, uh, and so this is a neighborhood that stretched a little bit further than just that particular block. And uh, I haven't done the research on the property records, but I'm sure I'm going to find that the Moras made even more investments than I'm aware of in real estate, and they rented out properties. Uh, and many other Cubans were perhaps encouraged also to buy property there and establish a sort of an enclave um, in that area. Uh, here's another example. The origins of Ybor City in the village, specifically in this neighborhood. Okay? And of course, the founder, principal founder of Ybor City was Vicente Martinez Ybor. And look at where he lived, at 218 East 14th Street. Uh, Vicente Martinez Ybor was a Spaniard uh, who had, uh, in Cuba, had a prosperous uh, business producing the brand El Príncipe de Gales, right? uh, the Prince of Wales. Uh, and um, he had his factory uh, in Key West and his operations in New York. But he wanted to get away from Key West uh, so that, um, uh, so primarily to avoid the labor strikes that, uh, that uh, started uh, occurring in the uh, tobacco and the cigar producing industry. And so uh, he was looking to relocate to this sleepy uh, fishing village uh, called Tampa. And the individual who made that possible was his junior partner, Eduardo Manrara. And look at where he lived. Uh, I'm guessing that house abutted the back, the, uh, the back of those row houses, probably abutted each other. And again, out of that neighborhood as well. So Ybor City, which starts uh, producing cigars uh, in 1886 uh, and would become the largest community of Cubans uh, at the end of the 19th century, surpassing even New York, uh, actually started in New York and started in this particular uh, neighborhood. So let me move on to what I think is, oh, I'm sorry. These are the Moras, right? This is where they are in Greenwood. Uh, there are a lot of Cubans of this um, uh, period, uh, particularly those who left after the war uh, of 1868 that are buried at Greenwood. In fact, I do occasionally a tour, um, uh, a sanctioned tour by the, uh, by the Greenwood Cemetery of tours of many of these Cubans. This actually happens with the tomb of uh, Maximo Mora, whom I showed you the picture earlier. And back here is the tomb of that household that we saw, Jose uh, was. Carlota Mora, who is married to Doha, uh, buried elsewhere in Greenwood. And I'm trying to find out if that is, in fact, the widow 
the widow of the executed uh, patriarch Domingo, uh, patriarch, uh, Domingo de Goya. Okay, let me move on to another site. This one I think historically is more important. It's Madame Rifu's Hotel. Uh, it occupied numbers 19 and 21 West 9th Street. This is the way the building looks now. It, it is the building that was there originally. Uh, it is now a condominium. Uh, specifically, these two doors here, these two uh, that are here, West 9th Street. Um, up until recently, uh, well, recently somebody opened actually a restaurant there called Madame Griffoux. Uh, and uh, and it closed, I think, a few years ago. But here was the entrance to that, and uh, it was actually the restaurant was underneath. It was in the basement. Um, it is located here uh, on West 9th Street between Fifth and Sixth Avenues. The reason I'm showing this map is because for a very long time, in most Cuban historical sources, the address was given as 21 East 9th Street, and that's because one of the original witnesses of the events that we're going to talk about actually made the mistake of, in his memoirs, writing it in East 9th Street. But all the census records and all the newspaper clippings, et cetera, show that uh, it was actually located in the site that I'm saying on uh, West 9th Street. Here, by the way, is the restaurant's menu back, uh, this is in 1892, that's in the very excellent uh, New York Public Library uh, menu restaurant uh, a collection of, of uh, menus. So the story of, uh, of why Grifu, the restaurant Grifu is important starts with Jose Martí. Of course, the, as you know, the uh, uh, towering figure of 19th century Cuban history, the apostle of Cuban independence who organizes the independence movement, the definitive independence movement that started in 1895, and he organizes that from New York. As you can see, he lived for a very long time, for most of his adult life, in New York, starting in January 3rd, 1880, until he leaves uh, to join the insurrection that he himself organized on January 30th, 1895. And that's when he leaves New York. Uh, here, by the way, is his passenger manifest of the SS France, where he had arrived from the Havre. He had been uh, essentially deported from Cuba to uh, Spain. He made his way to France, and here he is uh, in a passenger manifest. Uh, the event that we're talking about uh, at Madame de Fou's Hotel occurred on October 18th, 1884. And the background of this is that two of the generals of the uh, war that had ended in 1878, the Great War, the Great Ten Year War, uh, were trying once again to see if they could get things going, raise some money, or, uh, organize an army, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and essentially be able to, to take this war uh, to Cuba again. And they went to New York to raise money. And they didn't have actually a lot of success in doing so. And, uh, and uh, they were very disappointed at that. Uh, they made their headquarters in the Grifou Hotel, Madame Grifou, uh, who was French, had lived in Cuba. Her daughter was married to a Cuban. Uh, and they moved to New York, and she set up this, uh, this hotel, which was welcoming of all races and nationalities. So for example, one of the generals that I'm going to be talking about, who was an Afro-Cuban general, actually um, uh, was able to stay there uh, when many of his trips to New York previously in the 1880s. Uh, something that may not have been able to happen in the Fifth Avenue hotels. So this meeting takes place between Jose Martí, by the way, that's a good picture of him, who took Jose Maria Mora, of course. That's a portrait by Mora, Jose Martí, one of Mar Martí's best pictures. Uh, Maximo Gomez, the one who, had, uh, who was uh, one of the leading generals in the war, uh, of 1868. By now, he's fairly uh, elderly, but he wants to get back on the saddle and and once again start the uh, the war in Cuba. And two-year-old poet who hasn't had any battlefield experience, and he went to discuss with the uh, with the generals uh, the plan by which he had been 
Storm Parda, in which he was supposed to go to Mexico with Maceo to essentially uh, carry out the orders that would be given him. Uh, and at that point, to make suggestions uh, to General uh, Gomez as to how he should be running the campaign. And uh, he had some misgivings about the plan. And uh, Gomez, and I'm going to read a bit from my book on this, Gomez, with a bath waiting for him in an adjoining room and a high level of frustration with the whole New York community, found himself facing a poet and a writer, a civilian half his age, telling him how to run his campaign. He allowed himself, Gomez would later write, to make unsolicited indications to me without good reason, indications that were inappropriate to direct at someone who had been entrusted with responsibility for these matters. So when Martí started talking and making all these suggestions, Gomez interrupts him and says, look, Martí, just limit yourself to the instructions. As for anything else, General Maceo will take care of whatever needs to be done. And with that, he picked up his towel and went to take the towel. Martí was stunned. Uh, he waited around as a matter of courtesy. Maceo tried to uh, make excuses uh, for the general. Uh, but in the end, uh, um, not, uh, when the, uh, Gomez came back from his bath, Martí stood up and curtly essentially left the room. Maceo turns to Gomez, according to the account, and says to him, General, that man leaves here very upset with us. Perhaps, said the old soldier, shrugging. So this encounter in, in Madame de Diffus Hotel was to have a tremendous influence later on, um, on the events of Cuban independence. Because what in effect happened here is that the uh, man who was destined to organize the definitive movement in 1895 11 years later, became, as a result of this meeting at the Hotel Vieux, totally estranged from the two, the two leading generals of that war. And eventually, Martin would recruit right, these two generals 11 years later. But the, the, the meeting at Hotel Vieux had this tremendous impact of essentially uh, distancing these three icons of, uh, of Cuban history from each other. Um, Martí, as a result of this, actually writes uh, a letter to Gómez in which he renounces, he resigns from the entire enterprise and basically uh, issues those famous words that are in that line, which is where he says that a, um, a, a fight for the independence of Cuba cannot be simply uh, designed or drafted from a military garrison. Uh, a nation cannot be, and I'm going to look for the exact words, a nation cannot be founded, General, as a one where issuing orders in a military camp. Uh, and this is something Martí would learn. Uh, years. This happened at the Hotel de It's an important his event in Cuban, in Cuban history. And by the way, uh, about 10 years ago, there was an article in the New York Observer on the Hotel de uh, uh, talking about Mark Twain and a number of other writers and others who gathered at the Grifu and how the Grifu became an important center for intellectuals and, and writers in the 1880s, 1890s in New York. But there isn't a single mention of this history, of this history of how it was uh, very important in Cuban history. Let me then move to the third site. This is La Liga Interamericana, 74 West 3rd Street, corner of Thompson. And uh, I, this is the building that is at the address now. Uh, but I suspect this is not the building uh, that uh, where La Liga was at and that there was a different building there before because uh, there's a description of it as a row house uh, in which uh, the, uh, the individuals that met in La Liga um, uh, met in the top floor of what apparently was a three-story uh, row house. So although this is the site, but uh, I'm just not sure that this is the building. La Liga was started primarily by an individual by the name of Rafael Sierra. Rafael Sierra was a, uh, was a Cuban cigar worker initially. He was a man with great um, uh, intellectual preoccupations about Cuba and a writer. He became very quickly a friend with Martí. Martí uh, actually went to La Liga and taught because 
he and Serra, especially Serra, established La Liga as a place where uh, Afro-Cuban and afro Puerto Rican uh, uh, men and women would go essentially to improve themselves, to learn. There were courses on philosophy, there were courses on, on history and so forth. And it was a very important uh, place. Here we have the ladies of the, of the Señoras de la Liga who formed part of La Liga Interamericana. And this becomes important uh, in the 1890s when already we see a growing number of uh, Afro-Cubans that start migrating to New York City, especially attracted by the cigar industry. And many of them are cigar workers. Uh, in the 1870s still, uh, there were not that many Cuban cigar workers in uh, New York City. But by the end of the 1870s, by the 1880s, uh, you start getting a growing number of cigar workers who actually insert themselves into what was already, as we know, an important industry in New York, which was cigar manufacturing, which had been started decades earlier by German immigrants. Uh, the Cubans had a particular um, cachet about the fact that they were, you know, uh, Cuban cigar makers, and they were generally uh, elaborating uh, cigars made that were imported from Cuba, and those generally had a higher price. Uh, the reason La Liga is established in this particular place is because I found that, for example, in the 1880 census, uh, when you start getting a large number of uh, Afro-Cuban Afro cigar makers coming in, uh, most of a, a large number, a large concentration of them were actually in these, in this, in this block in the in the West Village. This is. Uh, West Third, uh, this is Sixth Avenue, Manetta Lane, and McDougal. And there were fully like 14 uh, Afro-Cuban families living in, in this block, of which 11 were actually engaged in cigar making. So this is, this is an important site. Again, I don't know if the building is the original building, but again, as I say, some of you may know more about that uh, than I do. Uh, I'm getting close to the end of my time. Those are then the three locations. Um, I presented here a lot of material that is not in the book because, of course, I didn't uh, emphasize locations like this uh, in the in the book itself. But given the fact that uh, that I have an audience here of uh, individuals interested in uh, in the in, in the village and its preservation, I thought I would emphasize that. So that's what I have, uh, Lena, uh, and uh, I would be really be glad to to entertain questions that. Uh, that uh, anyone may have uh, uh, about the presentation. Great, thank you so thank much. You. That was a wonderful presentation, thank you. Thank you. Um, so feel free to please um, ask your questions in the Q&A um, if you have them. Um, see a couple questions, so why don't I just get started. Um, uh, Rhonda wants to know, um, Rhonda is asking, uh, Maxima Gomez was born in the Dominican Republic. Um, what caused him to join the Cubans for independence? Uh, that is true. Um, you know, I'm not sure what caused him to do that. Um, uh, but he was, he, it wasn't just something, this was in many ways, this was his life's work. I mean, he had fought in the war of 1868 to 1878. So he was uh, very experienced in that war. And then he moved to Central America uh, after that war. He was living the life of, a, of a, you know, the land of gentry sort of in, in, in Central America. But he goes to New York uh, and to New Orleans, by the way, to try to raise money for, again, getting a campaign going, uh, which, again, that campaign that uh, Martí doubted about never really succeeded, the campaign that preceded, excuse me, the campaign that actually came to succeed was the one that Martí started in 1895. Um, and, uh, and, and he again was the, uh, the commander in chief, if you will, of all Cuban forces in the war between 1895 and 1898 that eventually resulted in the U.S. of course intervening and finishing that war. <coughs> He never, it's interesting, uh, Gomez, I think, 
always considered himself a foreigner in Cuba. In his correspondence, of course, he talks about when this war is over, it will be up to the Cubans to form their government, etc. It's not up to me anymore, I'm a foreigner. But he never actually went back to live in the Dominican Republic. He died in Cuba uh, in, uh, in the Republic, uh, I, I want to say um, somewhere around 1906, 1907, I'm not sure. And a man who spent 30 years in the battlefield, he died of sepsis from an infection in his fingers. Thank you. Um, let's see. Um, Uva wants to know, um, do you see the episode between Marti and Maximo Gomez as one of the first indications of the confrontation between civic value and militarism, democracy, and mm -hmm. revolution that has been part of Cuban history to our day? That's a good question. Um, up until this point, and, and one of the things that I argue in the book is that uh, Marti breaks the mold of Cuban activism in the United States. Um, not only does he break the mold, but indeed after him, the mold gets back together again. Uh, he's an exception to the pattern of Cuban their activism. And one of those had to do with precisely the lesson he learned at the Hotel Madame Grifo. Up, up until that time, the work of, of, uh, of Cuban exiles had been to raise money right, to outfit expeditions and send them off, you know, and, you know, see what happens and when they start shooting up in Cuba. That is, it was a, it was a movement entirely geared, essentially, towards the developing of an armed force. Mm -hmm. uh, Martí felt uh, that that was only part of the picture, of course. Uh, that you had to have essentially a strong civilian movement behind it. And that's why you organized the Partido Revolucionario Cubano, which was the party that then formed uh, the basis for this entire insurrection. Once he had the civilian piece in, in place, where he had raised money, he had all these clubs contributing money, he had a structure of a party, then he went looking for the generals. Right? And, and that goes back to his belief that, again, this cannot be uh, determined. This, uh, he, he wasn't just about overthrowing the Spanish. He was, of course, about establishing a nation. Okay. And so he felt that that simply couldn't be done by creating a military establishment and sending it on its way, especially since he was, uh, he learned a lot that, you know, Gomez had certain dictatorial tendencies. In fact, uh, in some of the correspondence uh, that Gomez uh, writes after, um, after that meeting with Martí, he says, you know, uh, what movement did not really have a dictatorship? Right? Mm -hmm. So uh, the general had his uh, sort of uh, martial inclinations. And, uh, and Martí, I think, needed the general, but at the same time, he had to have already a, uh, a uh, structure in place in which the army would be part of that. That's why it was important for him to go to Cuba when the insurrection starts. A lot of people felt he had to stay in New York uh, or he should have stayed in New York, and, but, he said, but essentially his decision to go with the army uh, that he had uh, funded and established uh, and to go with Gomez to Cuba uh, was an indication that you needed there a civilian presence. By the way, the way in which he reconciles uh, with Gomez is that he invites him to New York once he has all this money. And about, about one of the things that he does, and I have this in my book, is he takes him to Barnum. Marti loved the circus, right? And uh, when uh, Gomez comes to uh, New York in 18, I want to say 94, 93, uh, he takes him to Barnum uh, to, you know, uh, as a way of sort of bonding with the general. Uh, but yes, that, that was a very early indication of that, of that, uh, of that uh, duality right, of the military and the civilian. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, so, I have a couple of questions that were asked about the Afro-Cuban community. Um, and I also have a question, um, well, let's see. So, okay, Marie, Marie uh, Marte wants to know, um, were Afro-Cubans Afro treated differently than African-Americans at the time? 
What was the um, distinction there? Yeah, I think that most of the information that I have about that um, is primarily on terms of housing. Mm -hmm. uh, because I did a lot of work with the census and where people live and so forth. And I can tell you that generally, right, neighborhoods in New York City tended not to be um, as racially segregated as they would later be. Uh, but boarding houses, which is where most people of modest means lived, were almost always segregated. Uh, so that uh, Afro-Cubans, for example, when they went to New York, uh, tended to live in boarding houses with uh, African Americans. Um, there is a very interesting book uh, by Jesse Hoffnuck Garskoff uh, called Racial Migrations mm -hmm. that was published after my book, um, in which he goes quite a bit of depth into this and of the commonalities, right, and of the residential propinquity, if you will, the residential, the fact that they lived in the same places uh, as African Americans. Uh, so uh, overall, the, um, the profile of the Afro-Cuban uh, community in New York is one in which on one end you have the cigar workers who tended to live in the areas where cigar workers worked. And that was largely in the West Village, in Soho, uh, in Tribeca, that whole band uh, on the east, on the west side. Um, whereas, for example, many other Af uh, Afro-Cubans who, who, who lived in New York came as servants, if not slaves, to the sugarocracy. And of course, they lived where their uh, employers, let's put it that way, uh, lived, and that tended to be more uptown, uh, the Madison Square Park area. So I think one answer to the question on that is um, uh, that there was a significant amount of uh, residential segregation uh, between uh, white people and black people, largely, uh, especially in terms of where they live in boarding houses. I do, I do have in the book two cases uh, that sort of showed how New Yorkers tended to, to view Cubans largely as white, uh, um, well-to-do uh, individuals who were imported for sugar and merchants and so forth. And then had a great deal of difficulty when uh, there was a case of an Afro-Cuban that made it to the press. For example. And I have two cases of uh, two murderers, uh, about 20 years apart from each other, uh, that involved um, Afro-Cubans being accused of the crime and how the New York press treated that, those cases, right? <laughs> Again, uh, uh, and subject to the same sorts of discrimination, racial discrimination than one would expect uh, happen with African Americans. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, so I have a couple of questions that I'll sort of um, combine. Um, wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, the, the current uh, Cuban communities in the village or the surrounding areas, um, and if you know what, you know what the population number is or, or around. You mean, uh, Currently. Currently. Is that what the question is? Mm -hmm. Well, the, uh, as I said, the, the Cubans were by far the largest group in 19th century New York. And I think that was also true over the first couple of decades of the 20th century, right? Until, again, Puerto Ricans start coming in in greater numbers and, uh, and they take over at number one spot. I think Cubans are now like eighth or ninth in terms of Latino nationalities in New York City, right? There's like eight groups uh, in New York City that are uh, more uh, numerous than our Cubans, uh, including Mexicans, Salvadorians, uh, Guatemalans, Ecuadorians, um, and of course, Puerto Ricans and Dominicans. Um, but the, the post-1959 migration, the, 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 uh, the important settlement area was in uh, Uptown. In fact, in the 1970 census, if I recall, I, I did this at one time, the, uh, the census tract, the census of the area of Manhattan that had the largest number of Cubans, uh, was the census tract immediately surrounding where the George Washington Bridge uh, <clears throat> lands in Manhattan, mm -hmm. up there by 170th and so, and Broadway. 
Uh, that was the area where a lot of people fell. Also in the Upper West Side in the 90s, mm -hmm. which was also heavily uh, a Puerto Rican community at that time. Now, eventually, of course, uh, in the 1970s, uh, late 60s and 70s, the community of great importance in the New York region is actually in New Jersey. So, so uh, the numbers of Cubans in New Jersey, by the 1970s, the number of Cubans in New Jersey uh, far uh, outnumbered, the numbers there outnumbered the, uh, the number of Cubans in Manhattan, for example. Uh, there are also, of course, uh, Cubans in Queens and other areas, but New Jersey became uh, the largest community after Miami uh, in basically the 1970s. Uh, so, uh, I don't have a lot of information on Cubans in the village, but it wasn't a place where there was this heavier concentration that I know. Great, thank you. Um, Rhonda wants to know, uh, uh, was the large area in West New York, New Jersey? I'm sorry, I don't think I fully understand this, <laughs> this question actually, maybe Rhonda, if you, if you want to ask it again. Um, if not, uh, let's see what else we have. Um, oh, somebody's asking about rest, good Cuban restaurants located in the village. Uh, sure, gosh, that's a great um, question. Yeah. Uh, and what's that? That's a great question. Yeah. Yes. Uh, actually, I, I know of one, uh, you know, uh, I know of one in the, in the East Village, which name uh, now uh, escapes me. Um, uh, a lot of the, of the Cuban restaurants, the, the presumably best Cuban restaurant is, is in Queens. Uh, and um, in the village, unless somebody chimes in on this, I'd be glad to hear it. Uh, I'm not aware uh, offhand of where there's a good Cuban restaurant in the village. And, and anyway, I, especially post, uh, you know, during the pandemic, it's still there. Uh, for sure, maybe we, we can stay tuned for that. I see Rhonda, Rhonda is saying that there was a large population in New Jersey of Cubans in the 1970s. Yes, mm -hmm. that's absolutely uh, so, uh, that's really true. Uh, someone is asking about uh, that, that there was also a, uh, a large African-American community around the middle lane. So yes, this goes back to what I said before, which is that uh, uh, Afro-Cubans tended to live where African-Americans <laughs> and again, it wasn't so much what I was able to see in the patterns of, uh, of, uh, of residency. It wasn't so much that entire neighborhoods were racially segregated. But certainly, if you look at the boarding houses, which, which were, were many people of modest uh, and poor means lived, the boarding houses were usually racially segregated. There was, a, for example, in, uh, in Soho, there was a very large, um, in the 1870s, uh, uh, boarding house uh, ran from uh, the, who, that was ran from uh, by a woman from uh, North Carolina. Uh, it was on West Broadway, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, she had like thirty uh, uh, boarders, and it was almost they were all um, of Afro uh, Afro uh, Afro descendant, and in there they were mostly African Americans, but there were like six, seven, eight Cubans all of whom were either cigar workers or coopers, interestingly enough. Uh, so it's very, it's fascinating to go through the censuses. And uh, in my case, what I did was I used uh, some of the uh, like heritage and ancestry and so forth to look for individuals born in Cuba. That is, instead of looking for specific individuals, you look for individuals born in Cuba, and then uh, you, um, uh, you find their census bills, and I did this for 1850, 1860, 1870, 1880. Uh, and it's fascinating to see the patterns of settlement and where people lived and the impact of boarding houses. I, I see there's someone who says there's a Cuban restaurant, 222 Thompson. Yes, I can, I can visualize it. I think it's in the basement, uh, <laughs> and I forgot its name. <laughs> Sorrel also is offering that Cafe Corta, Cortadito is on. 210 Thompson, as well as we Havana to go on 229 Elizabeth Street. And then Marie also is offering uh, Victor's, Victor's Cafe, 
as well? Well, that one is not in the village, of course. That's a uh, Broadway place. Okay. Um, <laughs> so um, it's just about seven o'clock. Um, Lisandro, is there anything else that you want to address or um, any of the, the questions that are left that you might, if you want to maybe pick one um, to answer? Um, let me uh, let me go back to the questions and see. I, I was going to say that that um, if if anyone out there is is interested uh, in this topic, there's a lot more. Um, there's a lot more um, information that I did not mine here. For example, I, I really did not get into questions for reasons of time. I've, I've used the census. I used the the um, uh, archives. I used um, the uh, um, naturalization records, the whole, and I use some of the court records. Uh, but for example, I haven't really mined the municipal archives, the municipal records. And there's where I think there may be a great deal more that would fill in this history. But I think this history, as I've written it, is a good basis for someone who, perhaps a graduate student, uh, would like to go more into depth. Right? Uh, I have. Uh, Somebody here, Jennifer Pass, writes, were the Cubans given the support by the politicians in New York? Did they encounter any problems with the authorities? That's a very good question. Um, the, the Cubans, again, um, the, the fact that they were coming from an upper class in Cuba, that is, that they were these sugarocrats who came with money and so forth, and were lobbying for and behalf of Cuban independence, and, and I'm thinking especially of the period from 1868 to 1878, in which you have very prominent Cubans here uh, uh, in New York who were lobbying and working for Cuban independence. But again, they were individuals who had large bank accounts uh, because they were so selling their sugar here and they had accounts here. Uh, they managed to penetrate some of the upper levels <coughs> of, uh, of, of New York society. Um, uh, there, are, there are, for example, in some of the archives, uh, letters of regret or whatever with the mayor of New York and, and a number of people, they actually did a tremendous lobbying effort, unsuccessfully, matter, but a lobbying effort, um, not only uh, among the upper levels of New York society, uh, but also in Washington. Um, some of the uh, emigres like Miguel Aldama and others uh, met with Ulysses Grant. They met with Secretary of State Hamilton, uh, Hamilton Fish uh, so they were very well connected in the elite circles because they themselves uh, were coming from an elite background uh, in Cuba. And, uh, and actually, when one of Miguel Aldama's daughters uh, married uh, uh, in 18, I want to say 1880, 81, uh, the mayor attended. Uh, it was uh, celebrated by the, the, uh, the archbishop. And so forth. And when Francisco Vicente Aguilera, one of the Cuban patriots who actually died in New York in 18, I want to say 1872, uh, his mass was attended by all the dignitaries in New York, including the mayor. So yes, they were uh, New York. Uh, unlike the federal government, which showed itself uh, had to be neutral with respect to the to the to the conflict with Spain, um, the New uh, uniformly. Uh, and the, the elites in New York, not so much the press, but the elites in New York tended to favor uh, Cuban independence and, su and support these elites. In fact, Francisco Vicente Hilera not only did a lot of, of uh, uh, important people in New York attend his funeral, but he was actually laid, laid as his coffin was placed under the cupola of the uh, city hall in the rotunda. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Let's see if there's any more questions. Uh, I really appreciate it. these were really yeah, good questions. Yeah. There are more questions. I think we're actually going to to um, call it for tonight, just because we, we could be here all night with these questions. Um, where did Marti, uh, Just where did Marti live in New York? All over, but I don't see. I didn't see him in the uh, in the uh, in the village a lot. So he lived in a lot of places. Someone is asking about uh, uh, the book uh, again. So. Uh, let me just uh, bring this up a minute, if I may. That slide uh, that I had before, let me see if this will click. Okay. And that's the book on the left, the English. The Spanish is on the right, but the Spanish is circulating largely in Cuba. 
So this one is available through NYU Press, and I think you put the information in the chat. Yeah, uh, I appreciate uh, it in the chat again. NYU Press is actually giving a discount because of this uh, occasion. Yeah, and um, I just wanted to say, to, someone was asking before, um, if anyone came late or missed part of the talk, um, this is all being recorded and it will be uh, up on our YouTube channel and website within the next day. So um, take, a, take a look in your email, we'll be sending it out um, probably tomorrow. And we'll Great. include a link to the book as well. Wonderful, thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much again for inviting me to give this talk to be able to interact uh, with uh, many people interested in this. I was glad to see the, the turnout. And, uh, and uh, this story, by the way, is, is not finished. And uh, I hope to be working some more on it. Thank you so much. <laughs> Have a great night, everyone. And thanks for being here. Thank you.